Ed. Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. What do we mean by alien? Does it always mean someone from another planet? Have we been visited by time travelers? Hello and welcome to the 986th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno coming to you from WOON AM and FM Radio in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, on the Paranormal Radio app, from TalkStream Live, on YouTube, and via TuneIn.com. I'm Ben, and that was Paul. And today we bring you uh, one of our favorite guests on a subject that isn't as clear-cut as it seems. Uh, And to join in, you can give us a call, 401-766-1240, that's from anywhere, or you can email paul at behindtheparanormal.com. You've seen him on the History Channel's Ancient Aliens, The Real 4400, The Abduction Diaries, and many more shows. And we're honored to have him back with us today. A native of Baltimore, Maryland, Reverend Michael J. S. Carter worked for many years as an actor in New York City before deciding to enter the ministry. He earned his Master of Divinity degree from Union Theological Seminary in New York City in 2000. He has been a hospital chaplain, has served Unitarian Universalist congregations, and most recently moved to North Carolina to continue his ministry there. Michael is a longtime UFO contactee and the author of four books that I know of, including the Amazon bestseller Alien Scriptures, Extraterrestrials in the Holy Bible. So, Reverend Michael Carter, welcome back to Behind the Paranormal. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. I'm, I'm off today. Usually I'm at, in service. I'm at service now, but I got a Sunday off. So this is... This is my uh, church service this morning. Okay. Well, so. thanks. Well, thanks for spending your Sunday with us. Uh, yes. So I guess we'll we'll, we'll hop right into it. Um, yeah. Depending on the case, uh, there have been suggestions that what we call aliens can uh, be called people from other planets, extraterrestrials, uh, time travelers, being from parallel worlds or or other mm-hmm. dimensions or yes. ultra terrestrials, if you will, biomechanical yes. entities, demons, or something outside our current understanding. So what uh, say you? Well, I say um, it may be a little bit of all of the above. I'm not sure about the demon part, um, but, uh, you know, there are beings that we know uh, need hardware to travel to and fro. Uh, we, you know, we're calling them ships, UAPs, UFOs. There are some beings who can just show up, uh, and, and sometimes they take an anthropomorphic form. Sometimes they're just pure energy. Um, I, I think it's very, very hard to categorize. As far as most of the beings, if not all that I have seen, were physical beings that kind of, they showed up in my room a couple times, they touched me, they were physical beings. I'm assuming they had a ship somewhere outside or up in the atmosphere. But, I, you know, there's stories about beings who can just, they're just pure energy beings. So, and, and they, they don't, they may not even be extraterrestrials. With the high strangeness of this is one that we just have to, it, for me, it raises more questions than answers, and that we have to just be open to all of these forms of, of these life forms and reality. Regarding the time traveler uh, uh, hypothesis, uh, I remember I was telling your dad a book, uh, I didn't read all of it, it but it was, I think it was from Tennessee or Greenleaf Publications in Tennessee called um, uh, by Mark Davenport with Mark with a C. And his the book was uh, Time Travelers from the Future or something like that, Extraterrestrials. You can look it up on Amazon. Uh, and, and his hypothesis was that these beings were from our future. Because, you know, of course, he used quantum physics, which I'm not a physicist, uh, uh, Einstein's theories on time. And he said, if these beings can bend space and time, then that means they can travel through time. And then you got some people say, well, there's no such thing as time. You can see where this would go back and forth. But there is some, um, lastly, there is some, uh, I could not find any definitive proof. That, that these extraterrestrials were time travelers, but there is a story of uh, and, and a lot of a lot of what's in Dr. Goldberg's book is from hypnotic regression. I don't want to say it's gospel truth, 
because there are many influences, but many of the people that he's regressed uh, have said they've been taken aboard ships and told these things. Um, there was a story, and maybe you've heard it, Paul, um, where an individual said that uh, a, a star person had a crystal. It may have been Linda in one of Linda Morton Howe's books or what have you. And the crystal showed events from Earth history. One of the things that was uh, this individual said, and it may have been a government um, intelligence officer, that they were shown the crucifixion of Jesus. Yeah. Um, so if they could show us that, other events, too, you know, biblical events, archaeological, uh, scientific events were all on this crystal. That kind of technology would lend itself, I think, to if you can show me uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, then most likely you may have witnessed it. Yeah. But that's that's as that's as much as I could get with, you know, without giving out some disinformation or just being flat out wrong. Well, one of the things that's uh, come to our attention, uh, actually came to our attention some years ago, uh, when we were doing the uh, Rendlesham, that's 11 Forest. years ago now, I think, yes. the Rendlesham Forest does uh, sum up, and we did more on that case than any other show up to that time. We had all major witnesses on, et cetera. Well, uh, John Burroughs and Jim Penniston, uh, two of the major guys in that uh, case from 1980, Air Force security people witnessing mm -hmm. all these UFO landings, etc. Most people know about that. Uh, Jim was um, in a position where he actually touched one of these objects on the ground, saw these weird this weird script on it, couldn't recognize it, wrote it down. Mm -hmm. But he said later on <clears throat> in uh, in uh, under hypnosis that they were not aliens; they were us. Mm -hmm. so, so several people who were there uh, postulated that these were time travelers, not people yes. from another planet. Um, of course, it could be both, as you say, it might be all of the above. But, but we really, um, really don't know. There's a, well, why, why don't we? Everybody uh, who wrote in is interested in the um, time travel hypothesis. So let me uh, turn a question here over to what did I do with it? Here it is. A question from Peter yeah. Shelley in Bogota, Colombia, mm -hmm. our good friend and one of our occasional co-hosts and a really great questioner. Indeed. And Peter writes to us, uh, please ask Reverend Carter, what are some specific credible cases that strongly suggest time travelers and why? Yes, that's, that's, that's the gentleman. I, I, I could not find any. I could not find any, uh, again, that I could say were credible. Uh, there's, like I said, there's some books, Dr. Goldberg. There's another book more recent than that, and it's it's a hypothesis, it's a theory, but there's nothing definitive, uh, except for what we've got. You know, people in regression. And again, I don't want to discount that, but I, I can't say that's gospel truth. And so I, I, I could not find any. All I could find were some books um, where people were pursuing this, this line of thinking. Well, there, there were some interesting Internet phenomena regarding alleged time travelers. And Michael, yeah. you and I were talking about this on Friday. Yeah, and I didn't want to come with that, you know. Yeah. Well, just imagine there's really people, there are amazing numbers of people who take what they See, on the Internet is gospel. Yes. <clears throat> There's one guy, and I love this guy. He claims he has a time travel device. Excuse my voice, gee. And that he has gone back to uh, prehistoric times, and he's floating above this, uh, you know, Jurassic landscape or whatever, and he's describing all kinds of dinosaur species who, whom we know did not live at the same time. I, mean, I love this guy, you know. I mean, also, I believe the Earth's atmosphere was toxic. At it that was, point. yeah. He would, well, he was in some kind of bubble, but I, but yeah, we mentioned that too. You couldn't have breathed the air at the time, so good luck. 
Yeah. But uh, in any case, um, I think we have to def- define what or try to what is time travel. Uh, I know a physicist who was working on that, and he says you don't travel back and forth in time; you travel sideways. Because I guess our next uh, question maybe gets into that a little bit, and this is from uh, Phil in Savannah, Georgia. Ben, if you would do the honors here. Sure. Okie dokie. Uh, <clears throat> and Phil writes to us a couple of questions, and we'll start with the very first one because that is a great place to start. Uh, if some of the aliens... Mary quote, Poppins. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the Mary Poppins of the paranormal. Um, if some of the aliens, quote-unquote, are actually time travelers, could they be our species from the distant future? Well, we kind of... Yeah, we kind of went over that. Again, I, and I don't want to disappoint, but I have no definitive... I mean, this is all speculation. So, you know, and, uh, you know, as I found out in this phenomenon, I mean, with this phenomenon that anything is possible. But yeah, there's right. no, ev- yeah, any, you know, I don't want to rule out anything, but there's no definitive um, story, uh, narrative, experience where we say, yes, these beings are us from the future. Well, it might be in a way kind of run under our noses. Now, Phil gets into this, I think, in his second or third question, but um, what do you mean by time? I mean, it it's, it's apparently is uh, simultaneous, if you believe uh, Einstein and some of the uh, yeah, quantum his, physicists. It, yes. There is no past. There is no future. And so it's a function of our consciousness. And we ourselves are traveling in time in that sense all the time, so to speak. You know, um, and uh, all the, if the simultaneity is as literal as they say it is, we're involved in uh, still the happiest moments of our lives. Um, I'm still having my first hamburger and heaven only knows when that one, or whatever, you know, things that were pleasant or things that were unpleasant are still going on as part of this consciousness of ours. Uh, and we're living many lives in uh, parallel universes. Yeah, again, if that theory is correct, Ben, what does uh, so there's Bill there's goes a, on to ask another question. Or he two. does, um, and this we already sort of talked about, but you know, we might as well throw it out there. And we can maybe go into more depth. Which is, what is their agenda? Assuming they're time travelers, what would be their correct. agenda? Well, uh, I don't know. What I've heard is that. Their DNA is failing, and they're coming back to get ours. But that would imply a different physics. Mm. You know, Michael, which is possible. Um, um, you, uh, we just want to be clear about they, because there's so many different races. That's that, exactly the point. That, yes. that answer, you know, what do they want? Who knows? There's so many different people. And let me tell you, if I knew that answer, if we knew it, we could split the Nobel Prize money. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, what is their agenda? I think different. I think different races probably have different agendas. Um, some races may have a. Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, prime directive where we just observe. Yeah. Um, some, some may say, you know, if this gets out of hand with the nuclear stuff or, or with, uh, uh, what they're doing to the planet, maybe we'll step in. I mean, you hear all these things, but it, there's nothing definitive. And so again, as frustrating as it may be, believe me, I'm frustrated too that I can't, answer those questions definitively for you. Well, nobody but can. we're yeah. still in the dark around uh, what these different races want. We do know, obviously, that these, they're highly technological. Um, we're trying to figure out some of the things they do with 21st century science, and these people can be thousands, maybe millions of years ahead of us technology. Well, that uh, brings up a question. That. that brings up a question, you know, would they consider us as equals? Uh, Stan Friedman used to say that uh, these uh, aliens would be um, uh, looking at us as a primitive species mm-hmm. whose primary activity is tribal warfare. And he'd say, why would they want to talk to us? So, uh, I mean, I, I think that makes sense to you. 
I think it may make sense for some of it. I mean, uh, coming over from a theological standpoint, these some of these beings may have created us. And so it's always good to check in on your handiwork. Uh, You're right. Uh, you know, all, yeah, every, there are, you know, even though Fox News won't tell us or MSNBC, you know, and I'm not picking a political side. I'm saying we're always being misled. We're always only getting some of what's going on. Right. I think we can agree. Yeah. On yeah oh, yeah. Yeah. And so that that's my point by bringing that up. And so we people asking these questions, we don't know. But we do know that some of them are deeply spiritual Um and 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 probably again thousands of years ahead of us uh probably on on the spiritual aspect of things as well um are we but i i don't know if they would say all of us are primitive because uh there's some deeply spiritual people on the planet mm -hmm. and some of them have been visited by these beings and some haven't so i don't think they would write us off but i think generally speaking um, you know, generally speaking, uh, we're being observed. There has been some contacts, experiences, call them what you will. And uh, usually the message is not for all, uh, but the message is we, we need to change the way we do things. We need to change the way we are with each other. We need to change the way we uh, interact with this planet. Usually those are the messages. Yeah. Some type of spiritual growth is needed. Yeah. Now, and there, and, and and then there are those who are feeling violated. They have sperm taken, ovum taken, um, you know, just treated rather roughly, and dumped back wherever they were picked up from. Uh, so you, 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 these experiences run the gamut. Yeah. One of the things we often point out is that when we we use the term uh, term advanced. We often uh, mean that they are advanced technologically. But uh, that, I think, is a serious mistake. As we're always saying, who was the most technologically advanced country in the 1930s? Nazi Germany. You know, how'd that go? And um, so I think I'd rather be dealing with a species that is uh, spiritually and morally advanced than technologically advanced. So, Ben? Well, that, that brings up a really interesting point. Um, I, I was, uh, my dad and I had a conversation last week and I, I, there's actually someone, uh, out there, her name is Dr. Paula Boddington and she does a lot of research on the ethics of artificial intelligence and it's really interesting stuff and, uh, I heard an interview with her a while ago and she brought up some really interesting points because now AI is like the big buzzword nowadays, you know, and it's, it's, it's fascinating because she's like, well, it's interesting because, you know, the first question is, how do we know it's conscious? And then she's like, then she fires back with, well, we don't even know if we're conscious. How do we know if an artificial intelligence is conscious? And she basically says, well, no, because it operates within parameters that we set. And so whoever is setting the parameters, that's, and it operates within those, that's kind of how you determine whether it's moral or not. If the person creating it is moral, <laughs> then it will be moral. <laughs> But then you need to figure out, well, how can an artificial intelligence determine morality? And, and it can't, only because it's it's built within a certain set of parameters. And so it comes down to the people who create it. And so with it's the same with technology, right? And, you know, there's this whole theme in, like, early civilization where, you know, the gods come down, they give us technology, and then we goof around and mess it all up, and then the gods have to come back and fix it. And and it's it's this this whole Deus ex machina that keep that keeps happening over and over and over and over again, and and you know we've never really left the Tower of Babel so to speak. We're still trying to do the same things. Arguably, AI is now the newest Tower of Babel because essentially the whole goal of of humans having technology in the first place is to control the world around us. That's really it's it's our whole thing. You know, there's really only two things that an entity such as a human wants to expand oneself and to protect oneself. And so by expanding ourselves, we try to use technology to expand into the world around us, but it requires great sacrifice. It, you know, we have to sacrifice our, our memories, our, 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 you know, by that I mean like, you know, why bother remembering things when I could just look it up on my phone? Or, you know, we have to sacrifice our social lives in order to be parasocial in a sense. 
to be to have sort of these parasitic social lives where we live through other people and we we negate all real life connections so that we can have these fake sort of idealized connections through other people and so the whole point of this essentially is that this whole theme of technological advancement i mean personally i in in my in my generation i look around and you know there was a recent statistic that came out that uh suicide rates are just going up further and further you know every year you know and and it's 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 sad because it's like you know it doesn't it doesn't have to be that way and especially you know the whole covid thing kind of really really shined a light on a very sensitive subject which is the increasing isolation that we all have you know even even as like you know it's it's nice that my dad and I get to be in studio and do this and we don't have to be you know apart different parts of the world and it's it's nice you know it is something different about having a face to face interaction but at the same time it's like you know this increasing convenience is is sort of a sacrifice you know of of isolation you know and i think really the whole thing when i think of you know oh they're so advanced whoops then they we think that 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 means oh it's great they're doing great and it's like i don't know i see advancement on our end maybe it's because humans aren't ready for it and we're trying and trying and we're like this is a great idea because we're ultimately very idealistic and irrational creatures that perhaps it is that oh this is great everyone can connect and then it's like it's not real connection you know and we increasingly abstract ourselves from the quote unquote real world and i i think that the really really the biggest sort of stumbling block when it comes to well you know they're so advanced it's like i don't know man it's like i look around and like we're getting more advanced by the day and it just it it honestly i'm not a luddite or anything but it it does kind of freak me out a little bit for the future well you said a lot of stuff um for me ai we're going there anyway whether no matter who, if you think it's good for the planet or bad for the planet, this we're going to a Star Trek world. The only difference, technologically speaking, um, when we're talking about advancement of star people, at least I think of it as what they've done is they've they the, at least the ones that I, the, the ones that I visited, the after effects of my visits with, with them is that they have found a way to merge their spirituality and their technological prowess. That's something that we have not been able to do as yet on this planet. With the technology that we get, we make weapons. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, that. I mean, that's the crudest way to put it, but that's what we do. Um, and so... And, and I think, too, that we don't want to fall into the trap of thinking th- that my human incarnation, th- that they would think like me. You know, mm, maybe right. they don't experience that isolation. You know, that's the thing. Sometimes we go, well, I think like this. Well, we do that with each other. I think like this, so shouldn't that person over there think like that? That may not be it at all. Mm. Yeah. And and we need we need to... to, 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 to to always remember that, and then one last thing, um, and don't let oh let me because I know Paul, you were going to jump in. To me, AI, it, it's the technology. It's like money to me, in the sense of money is not good or bad. It's our intent with it, and the same thing with most of the people I know who are leery of AI. They're not really leery of AI per se. They're leery of it being used in ways that will keep us divided. Yeah, no, that's accurate. And, and, yeah, 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 yeah. Because you can use the technology for good, but we just don't. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that the story of well, humanity? On that yeah. cheerful don't. note, why don't we take our mid-show break? You're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WOON 1240 AM, 99.5 FM in New England's very nice Blackstone River Valley. And we'll be right back with our great guest, Reverend Michael J.S. Carter. So stick with us. Hi, this is Joe Callahan, your Mater D inside the Tiki Bar, heard Monday nights at 6 
On ON Radio, it's one full hour of Jimmy Buffett music. The Tiki Bar is brought to you by Attorney Bob Lauder, the Carew Investment Group, Pep and Lumber, and Family Discount Furniture. ON Radio, ON Worldwide, you can depend on us for public service. ON Radio. Well, here we are back behind the paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WON AM and FM Radio. And we're with our great guest and our good friend, Michael Carter, Reverend Michael J.S. Carter from North Carolina, uh, whom you have seen on Ancient Aliens and many other places in the media, author, lecturer, researcher, and... Um, All-around Renaissance man. I think so, yes. Why, thank you. So, Ben, you have a... Uh, you wanted to continue the AI, and so did I, but... Uh. Well, it's sort of, well, uh, kind of. I, I have sort of a, a point that kind of encompasses encompasses this. I don't know if it's a point, but it's it's an observation, I suppose. Um, there There's there's sort of this way that humans organize civilization that we've always kind of done, right? E- even from the first cities to, like, you know, now, right? Where we kind of have this, this society of, of concentric circles, and the further you get away from the center, sort of the more it deviates from the center... And sort of on the outskirts of civilization, there's always the monstrous, the unknown chaos, really. And and we're always trying to figure it out. And, and we never quite can. And it always comes across differently to different people. And I always find it fascinating because I, I always try to bring up to people who are like, oh, well, you know, I, that's why I appreciate your point of view so much. That it that it's like, well, you know, they're, they're extraterrestrials or whatever kind of beings they are that are, you know, benign or, you know, they're, they're, they're benevolent. Or they're malignant, and they're they're all over the place. But you know, it's I always kind of brings out people who are kind of one way or another. They're like, oh, they're all good, they're all bad, and it, and it's and there's sort of this this idea that everything on the outside of sort of our our structured quote unquote structured um, civilization that we've sort of created, there's this monstrous thing on the outside of it, you know, that we can't quite define. But we try our best to, you know, whether we try to use science to explain it or or we use spirituality to to explain it. Because, I mean, if you look back at, like, some ancient translations of the Bible, they had, like, they had unicorns in there, uh, centaurs, mm-hmm. and, and all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah. And they did their best to kind of explain what they couldn't explain because it was all on the outside, right? It's like um, I heard this really interesting dis- discussion a long time ago. That um, you know the when when like the first sort of people went out into the desert to sort of get away from civilization, you know uh, this this very very famous uh, theologian uh, Metropolitan Callistos Ware, a blessed memory. He he made a real interesting. He was he he was I called him Bishop Gandalf personally because he kind of he he kind of sounded like Gandalf. He looked like Gandalf, huge beard, yeah, he did. and he would he would have these very very dry sense of humor. And he, he would have this very, very learned British accent because he went to, like, Oxford and he was there with, like, Tolkien and all these guys. And he, he gave a, a really fascinating lecture on um, the Desert Fathers. And it was it was super interesting because he was like, well, when I was ma- making at my getting my doctorate and I, I, ma- I made a thesis and I, 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 I had went on and on about, you know, the beauty of the desert and silence and solitude. And when I presented it to, to my professor, she said, that's all very good, but you're wrong. And, <laughs> and essentially she was like, they didn't go into the desert because it was quiet. They went in there because that's where the demons were. And so... <laughs> So that oh, was yeah. so that was a really interesting point because it's this idea that something on the outside of of civilization far away is where the monstrous exists and where these these unknown entities exist and we we try our best to define it and it's almost like you know when you go further into into the sticks if you will it's it gets kind of more and more freaky outside you hear all these sort of modern um, urban urban you know myths basically of you know skinwalkers wandering around the Appalachians and and like oh you don't go outside at night in the Appalachian mountains or whatever because there's skinwalkers out there and it's like you know it's funny because people are like talking about skinwalkers nowadays and I'm just like oh okay well I mean we've we've known what these were for years but now they're in the normal lexicon because mythology still stays within civilization even if it's just characterized in the paranormal nowadays so I mean that being said you know we, we do our best to define these things but really, at the end of the day, it's kind of the same thing where chaos kind of exists on the outside. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that we, 
you know, we've always otherized. You know, that's beyond the uh, that's the unknown, and and since I'm afraid of it, I have to label it. Uh, we do that with people, places, things. It's 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 what we do. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, we should continue this as a species, but we if we don't understand it, we fear it. And we'll give it a name. I mean, you, that's why we hit the alien. Alien, that's not the greatest name, but we don't understand you. You are so other than us, or we'd like to think so. And you come from the great beyond. And so it's very human to do the things that we, that, that we do. Uh, who was it? Words, words said we, we murder to dissect. We have to compartmentalize everything right. in life. Uh, um, I, I want to get back, though, to the technology. Um, I, I'm going to look at the Grenada Treaty. I'm, I'm going to, my point of departure is going to be that I believe it's true, that um, Eisenhower did meet. But if you look at the story, it's almost like a parable, really. Um uh, uh, you know, he, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's, um, he's away, he sneaks away, he's, a tooth came out allegedly, he's eating some fried chicken, uh, Eisenhower, he goes away to the, I forget which Air Force base, and he meets a group of Nordic people or tall white people, more humanoid, right? And they say to him, basically, What's up with this nuclear pro? What, what are you doing? You need to walk this back. You don't know what you're doing. We need you to, to, to back off from this. Eisenhower, I wouldn't have wanted to have to make that decision. Eisenhower, according to the story, um, says uh, we can't do that. We don't live in a utopia. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and... Um, when, and, and when you read, he also, like a week after that, 10 days after this meeting, the treaty, he, they do some nuclear testing. The, the, the Nordic folk say, we can teach you how to grow spiritually, but you need to stop your nuclear program. Eisenhower says no. Okay. Then a, a, a group of greys, and I'm, I'm, I'm being meticulous here, not all greys, a group of greys approach Eisenhower and say, we will give you technology. We just want to take a few people, we'll give you their names, you know, maybe some cattle, we will do some experience, some experiments. Eisenhower allegedly says, we can't stop you. And, you know, this is, I'm, I'm talking about if you read Lieutenant Corso's book, if you research it, Michael Sala's book on, on this. And he says, I can't stop you. And then so he signs this treaty. And um, he can't tell the American people. Obviously, he's bypassed the Constitution, everything. And we're living that legacy now. The point I'm trying to make is, oh, and, and, and just as a caveat, when, when, uh, 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 Werner von Braun talks about how they were getting their technology, Hitler, and during World War II, the technology he got was from a, a different group of Nordic people. I say that for a couple reasons, because um, a lot of people look at the Nordic people and say, since they're so blonde, blue-eyed, and beautiful, they're more like us. They're more humanoid. But they had a renegade faction working with the Nazis. The point I'm trying to make with the technology in all this, it's almost biblical, but, or from the Upanishads or whatever, we all face that every day, guys. Do I cultivate the, 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 the spiritual in me? Or do I let technology take over? I mean, I just gave the example of macro because we're talking about governments, all right, and, and Eisenhower talking to these off-world intelligences. But what he had to face was what we all face, on, on, you know, the every man or woman level of how do I stay true to myself in a world that's technologically gone overboard or doesn't have the wisdom to use it? Do I just go with the flow of everything? 
because this is what technology can do? Or do I say, wait a minute, I need to center myself. I need to cultivate my inner life so I can deal with the technology. You know, does that make sense? No, I I, I follow you. I I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the technology is neutral. The technology is like money. It exists. Uh, It's our intentionality. And Eisenhower, I wouldn't have wanted to make that decision. Uh, He did what he thought was best. But if you start one lie, and here we are 70 years later, we're still doing it. They had the Foo Fighters back then. We got F-16s. Mm. They were they were they were they were following this technology in World War II and before crash disc you know the story but here we are now living that legacy still being lied to by the government and living in this highly technological age people are afraid uh, we have our culture wars over race over sexuality we're still dealing with this stuff but people, and, and then you throw in the technology, it's a recipe for disaster. So how do we cultivate our spirituality? Because I believe that's what this whole phenomenon is about. And you don't have to be have people come from another dimension or another planet to make you spiritual. I'm not implying that. But what I am saying is that life is fast, life is crazy. We're going into a new age. Each of us has to decide what kind of person we want to be. Mm. No, I, 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 I hear that. Um, that's and that's just a, all the stuff. Oh, yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I, I think of it like <clears throat> how, how sort of the, the ancients kind of viewed the world, that there were these kind of like layers that were happening all at the same time. And now I, I think with, with the dawn of, of the Internet, that kind of adds another layer of things mm-hmm. because we almost exist – we all, we all know that we exist in multiple different layers, right? So we, you know, we have the physical world, spiritual world. It's all kind of happening all at the same time. And now we have this sort of odd way in which we kind of view and interact with each other through this through through the internet, right? And 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 it's like we sort of allow different portions of ourselves to be shown, but while we interact on this this other sort of manufactured plane of existence. And that that's definitely something I'm going to be considering for a while now. <laughs> you just added yeah. a, a whole other yeah. dimension to yeah. this as well. <laughs> well, I remember. No, uh, it really is, and 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 where we're going is it, it can we can go either way, uh, but right now we seem to be. I'm talking collectively speaking. Mm. As, as you know, we seem to be going where more money, more material, more money, more technology. And we don't really have the wisdom to no, to deal with the technology. No, there's a very high high lack of discernment nowadays. It's it's a skill that's not very well prized. Um, does not get you jobs. But that's that's really interesting because there's sort of this idea that there's these persistent symbols and, and themes throughout civilization, right? So like, um, you know, the idea of like sacred space. Which is not really a super well. I wouldn't say it's it's gone nowadays, but it's definitely changed a lot. But like you know, um, an example being like the not the Nile River, right, or the Red Sea, even better. So like you know, you go back into into, into you know Exodus, right, and we see oh well he parted the Red Sea, but there was a really interesting comparison I heard that was basically like okay well you know that's a mistranslation and really it, it should read the reed c r e e d which was essentially the egyptian version of the river styx and so the idea was that the red sea and the reed sea were the same thing because mm-hmm. it's you know any any place can become a spiritual place you know if given the right circumstances so it added a different dimension to to exodus because essentially it was like well you know god's fighting the egyptian gods while the Hebrews are fleeing Egypt, and so it adds this other layer of existence to it. And that was sort of a thing throughout a lot of different civilizations, like caves always led to the underworld or whatever, which is why Odysseus goes to the mouth of a cave and he spreads a bunch of blood there to get the shades to come up, and so he can talk to Achilles. And it's the same sort of thing. But nowadays, we we have this, you know, the internet can take you anywhere at the same time, right? You know, mm-hmm. even in, not even like in a metaphysical sense. It's like if I wanted to look up ancient Egypt on my phone, I could find a video and boom, there I am, you know. But, you know, it's 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 sort of this odd idea of, of sacred space that's sort of brought to you in in this sense. And so I, I think it's important to, to consider that 
because you know, we we have this these ideas that persist in these these archetypes, as Carl Jung would call it, right? That that persist in these symbols, but just because they're symbols doesn't mean they're not real and don't have impact. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it reminds me of the old saying that just because so, uh, an event didn't happen doesn't mean it's not true. Mm. Right. I wanted to suggest a film that Michael suggested to me a few months ago that I watched called The Eleventh Green. Oh, my God, yes. Yes, uh, really outstanding. And it's a little out there. you got President Obama sitting down with President Eisenhower, you know, in a sort of a meditative state or something of that kind. And... Uh, the uh, the sort of the wisdom and the insight of this into the alien um, ethos hmm. from our point of view is really very good. And I'm thinking, too, of uh, speaking of AI, Nigel Kerner, the late Nigel Kerner, uh, believed that the greys were biomechanical. Yes, at least some of them were, yeah. Yeah, and we did a show on that few, a few weeks ago with two of his uh, associates. And uh, just another indication that we don't have the slightest idea what the heck is going on. Exactly. Yeah, and, so. and, 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 and the technology it would require to create these grays. Uh, and I'm not saying all oh, because some of them are very big. You know, some you know they're like robots. Uh, people would say, okay, you, okay, let's see if they think like us. If we were going to go to another planet or even the military, you send a probe, you send a patrol. You don't necessarily send a flesh and blood person, right? Right. Because you don't really know. So, so some of the grays, especially the smaller ones, may be artificial intelligence, but they're brilliant. I mean, uh, 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 the technology behind that is really, I mean, you're talking millions of years ahead of us. Yeah. So uh, before we burn up the hour here, Michael, tell us about uh, where people can find out more, what you're working on. Uh, you oh. Some more filming for Ancient Aliens, I understand. Yeah, well, okay, thank you. Um, something uh, that I shot back in, oh uh, boy, uh, the early, early September, uh, it's called, uh, the show's called America's, I'm sorry, History's Greatest Mysteries. Oh, cool. It's on the History Channel um, with uh, Lawrence Fishburne is the host. And we ju it just aired Tuesday. And I usually don't watch these things. At the beginning, I used to, maybe in 2014, 2015, the newness. You know, I go, I get paid, and I come home. Yeah, right. Um, but my but my my wife said, "Well, I'm interested, and I want you to sit here with me." So I watched it. It's it, the segment is the tw um, the 25th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. Oh, that's right. Oh, I meant to. Yes. I didn't know you were in that. That that's yeah, a new it series just came too. On Tuesday. Okay. So uh, that's what I just finished doing, um, and it's just starting to air. They did a really good job. Uh, Alejandro Rojas is in it. Okay, yeah. Uh, Lynn Cate, uh, two other, uh, a guy from MUFON, and I forget there's another gentleman. Anyway, I, I was impressed with what they did. So, you know, I think it's season four, episode five. Okay. But it's streaming now. All the people um, who have been on the show. I, yeah, I don't watch yeah. stuff I'm in either. I, you know, I don't like seeing I myself. If know, Ben's with me, I watch it. Right. No, I just, the I just don't watch does. it. Um, but they do a great job, even with Ancient Aliens. I mean, I don't watch it, but I know they do a great job, and people always... They do. Ben's mom they likes it. And yeah. uh, remember, that when it comes to TV, it's like... She's very hard to please. Yeah, like that old commercial... Yeah. And they've done like some good stuff. Like it, he hates everything. They've done, yeah. And and uh, I'm going back out to Michigan, to Lake Houghton, Lake Houghton, Michigan, in September for their uh, uh, UFO conference. Uh, UFO con and uh, that's about it. Just church has been keeping me busy. My daughter will be going off to college in about eighteen months. I don't know where yet. She doesn't know where yet. So life has been full, and um, you can get my books and everything on Amazon uh, or Barnes and Nobles. Okay, excellent. Let's try to work in one more question. This is from Lauren sure. in, in Connecticut. Sure and thing. If you would. I will. I, I will. <laughs> and uh, Lauren uh, writes to us. Um, I've recently listened to Greg Brandon on his YouTube channel where he puts forth an interesting theory that instead of fighting global warming with encouraging people to lower their carbon footprint 
and the regulations uh, geared towards CO2 in the atmosphere, governments, the UN, etc., are actually in league with the alien races that have already uh, they're already living among us, and the governments are helping in terraforming Earth so it can become more ho- a more hospitable environment for them, even though it isn't uh, an actual uh, ideal environment for us. I'd be interested to hear what Reverend Carter thinks of this, and you and Ben as well. Well, that's different. Michael? Yeah, yeah. Well, you go first, Ben. I, I, I'll just say this very, um, uh, very. I mean, Paul. I just very quickly. I don't know where people get their information, so I don't know if that's true or not. Well, you know, kind of. I, I, I just, I'm just very vigilant about that now because yeah. there's so much information and disinformation, and some of it has a kernel of truth in it. Right. I'm not saying that's not true, but I'm saying I have no way of verifying that. Yeah, um, Ben, you want to? Yeah, we'll sure. Throw that in your lap. <laughs> Here you go, kid. Um, well, there's there's an author I, I really like who who discusses this. He was an old school like 80s and 90s environmentalist and like was involved in a lot of <clears throat> really big climate protests and stuff in the 90s. And uh, his name's Paul Kingsnorth, and he writes really really interesting Substack um, on a lot of different things. And he has some really cool ideas that I, I really like. Uh, but he he talks a lot about um, this idea of this thing called the machine that we've kind of built, like the capital M machine, that that's sort of like uh, a, a metaphysical thing that we've kind of created. <laughs> that um, he was like, you know, back in the '90s, he he did an interview that I saw a while ago where he basically was like, you know, there was he was like, it was really cool. We advocated for more agrarian societies and like kind of stepping back because really we saw that you know what the, the big thing was. Uh, that was really hurting everything was you know industry and 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 all of that like oil companies and, and things like that. It's like and then somewhere around the 2000s everything switched up. Where we're like, well, we need more wind farms, we need more solar panels, we need more of this and this and this. And he was like, the reason that that happened was because a lot of companies started getting involved, and instead of actually helping, they decided, well, we're going to make money off of this. So we're going to basically market these things that seem like they're good for the environment, but they really aren't. And you know we're gonna we're gonna monetize you know environmentalism, and that was kind of the big thing. And he he was like, well, you know the he was like, really the, the problem is that I, I'm not sure. I think it's easier to point to some sort of like, ah, well, it's it's uh, <laughs> it's 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 aliens that are 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 messing with the environment, not us. It's like it's kind of like you know washing the outside of the bowl and not the inside, as Christ would say, right? Where it's like you know instead of <laughs> Looking at ourselves and seeing what we're doing wrong, it's like, well, you know, it's 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 aliens and stuff that are really, you know, messing everything up, and that's not really fair because you know we we've sort of you know written ourselves into a corner because now our entire society is based off of fossil fuels, you know? and then taking it away, it's like you know, it's 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 kind of I don't know, it's just it, there's a whole lot of backward stuff going on anyway. So the the whole point of of uh, Paul Kingsnorth argument is is that. It, it's it has a lot more to do with greed more than anything else, and I I kind of I tend to agree with that on, only because it's like you know I I remember growing up watching a bunch of documentaries you know they would sit us down in like sixth grade and be like you're ruining the planet <laughs> and they they would throw on these documentaries that were like we need to do more to fight pollution and it's like you know go and use these egg cartons and make them into planters and it's like I don't understand how that's helping but okay. <laughs> Right, right, and and so it's, but then it, it changed. Things things really changed really in the last couple of decades, and it's it's even more evident nowadays, especially with BlackRock kind of going in and saying, well, you know, we created this algorithm to make investors kind of, you know, to to rate your company so that you can, you know, know, you know, oh, should I invest in this in this company? Are they morally, you know, like, <laughs> are they moral? That and that was kind of that was kind of the whole thing was like you know they they were like yeah let's make this whole system I don't have all the all the story in front of me but essentially you know in 2016 BlackRock launched this whole uh, program that was that they created it was an artificial intelligence that would basically take a bunch of data points from your company and then basically give it a rating and say okay well this is a really high rating because they do a lot to kind of help help quote unquote society. And so that's why you kind of have have this whole whole thing where companies are trying to get more socially active, 
and it's it really it's just to make more money. It's it's not about actually helping people. It's about making more money. So I mean, I think it's I think it's probably safe to say that when it comes to aliens, you know, messing with the environment, I don't I don't know. I just don't really see that. I don't see what what why they would gain anything, or why would they why they would even want to live here in the first place? It's like, <laughs> well, yeah. well, Lauren perhaps has a higher opinion of governments than I do. Uh, I find that most governments couldn't organize a game of solitaire. Uh, the U.S. government is so enormous that uh, half a dozen of what the other half is doing when it comes to the whole UFO secrecy thing. No, some you, agencies you, know things. That try to deal with them. the IRS, and that'll that'll teach you all you need to know yeah, about right. government so, efficacy. <laughs> so uh, don't get us in trouble. So uh, as far as uh, the government's plotting with aliens, I, I just don't see that, Michael. Yeah, like I said. Uh, um, uh, you know, I, I, when I hear stuff like that, and I mean no disrespect, I'm like, you know, where are you getting that from? Because when you start making those kinds of claims, you got to come up with something. Right, now, right. the part of the truth of that is probably that we are in touch with off-world intelligences, our, guy, our, our, our um, government, and other governments are as well. And so that's, the, that's why I say there's always a kernel of truth in these things. Mm-hmm. But then to say, and I agree with you guys, and, and it's, um, you know, it, it, it lets us off the hook. Uh, we're yeah, not responsible. Right. It yeah. lets, it, and, and there are two ways with that. I know some people, and they may be right. They say that because of the nuclear threat, because of, uh, you know, the movie Oppenheimer's coming out, we're going to be revisiting some of these things, these mm-hmm. nuclear tests and stuff, it reverberates in other dimensions and on other planets. And so people will say that that's why um, this group of people came to world leaders, Eisenhower specifically, and said, what's up with this? You know, you, you, you're gonna, you, you don't know what you're doing. That that part is, is, is there as well. I, I, but I'm also very leery of people who say, and this is not what the question was about, so we're not going there. Um, the aliens will come and save us. I don't like that word, but they're, go- they're going to come and save us. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, again, it's this children mentality, this child's mentality that you come clean up our mess. I hear people say that whether you believe in God or not. They say, well, why is God allowing this to happen, this shenanigans? But meanwhile, it's human beings who are causing it. Well, that's so we right. Want, we want Big Daddy or Big Mommy or we want, we want, some off, we want somebody to come in and save us. Mm. But, you know, we made this mess. Yeah, and yeah. it would be lovely at the 11th hour the cavalry comes in and these ships save us from ourselves. But I wouldn't count on that. We we made a mess of things, and you know, in order to mature, uh, we need to face up to that and start making the corrections that we need, and stop blaming it on saviors and extraterrestrials and uh, mm. other people instead of looking at ourselves. You know, a very wise and salient point to end the show on, uh, Michael. We're out of time, but stick around, and uh, we'll do our announcements and. Uh Take it away, Ben. Sure thing. Well, we got some stuff cooking uh, in the in the old the old uh, f- the fridge there, and you can look for us at the New England Parafest that's in Kittery, Maine, uh, on April twenty second and twenty third. We will debut a new presentation on mimics. Uh, we'll be at the Para Expo twenty twenty three aboard the USS Sam at Quincy, Massachusetts, May nineteenth, twenty first. Uh, we'll be speakers and we'll broadcast live from the ship on our Sunday, May 21st show. At this event, we will debut a new presentation, When We Die. Mm. I should qualify that bit. Yes, uh, it, it's bound to be... <laughs> we won't be dead when we present it. <laughs> it would be like a, like a uh, Weekend at Bernie's scenario. <laughs> So you can visit our show website that's BehindTheParanormal.com and uh, where you can find nearly 1,200 hours of our regular shows and special broadcasts since 2008 from CBS Radio, Achieve Radio, and here on WON, AM, and FM. Uh, And also you can hear many of these broadcasts on major podcast platforms, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. And we even have a show app. It's free at BehindTheParanormal.com right there on the main page. You can browse our books along with those of our guest co-hosts. At our show website, again, that is BehindTheParanormal.com. Also visit our charity page with links to several good causes we've adopted. 
including uh, Hope for Hilldale Cemetery, Haverhill, Massachusetts, USA Cares, Canadian Veterans Advocacy, Hel- Helping Haiti's Orphans, which is my favorite. Mm. And uh, we know the people who run these, so we can vouch for them. So what's going on next week, Ben? So next week, uh, that is uh, March 12th, we will welcome back the legendary Whitley Strieber for a look at one of the weirdest experiences on record, the master of the key. Uh, depend- Sounds like Ghostbusters. Yeah, I know. That's it. <laughs> Are, you key, the key? Are you the key master? Well, apparently he <laughs> is. Well, I'll leave you today with a quote from everyone's favorite 13th century philosopher and theologian, Rumi. It sums up the philosophy of light that we like. Knock and he'll open the door, vanish and he'll make you shine like the sun, fall and he will raise you to the heavens, become nothing and he'll turn you into everything. I'm Paul Eno. And I'm Ben Eno. And thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey and we shall see you next time on Behind the Paranormal. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of... Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.